um, everybody's coming in. We're going to talk about what we're going to do today. So, uh, Lanini is going to give a talk and after that we're going to play trivia. But for those who are new, who are joining us, uh, the trivia works in, as a fundraising trivia. So, um, we have a trivia pot. Everyone is uh, encouraged to donate or contribute a dollar to the trivia, but it's totally voluntary. And uh, Kanan would flash the instructions on how you can do that. So, uh, we're right going to play a round of right now. So, we're going to play a round of trivia. And at the end, whoever wins will decide um, who will be the beneficiary for uh, the trivia pot. So, we, everyone's yep. supposed to choose a beneficiary, which is a local um, Singaporean environmental NGO or charity. Yep. So, today's quiz um, abbreviation is NGO. So that is a reminder for you to go pick out your NGOs and uh, update it on our live Google Sheet. Okay, and uh, standard stuff, we will get your answers from you via email at the end of the whole round. And also our trivia pod is open, so you guys can uh, pay now me or you can PayPal me at jkananraja. Okay, uh, last week we raised $130 and uh, it went to Acres. So, and the week before was $90 to um, Wildlife Reserve yeah, Singapore yeah. Conservation okay. Fund. So, yeah. All so the Donation receipts are online on the website or web page. Yep. So, um, yeah. So, let's see who wins this week and where the uh, donations go to. Right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave this on here and I'm just going to kind of like circle to back and forth. Hopefully, I don't go to the next slide where the questions begin. So, yeah. And also, for those of you who kind of uh, didn't know, we're having Nalini today, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, bioconversion using insects. I'll let Nalini talk about what insects she's using, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to give away too much of it, and uh, what happens. Okay. Uh, as usual, we will start at about five minutes past four. So, uh, we've got three more minutes. So if you guys, if you guys already have questions for Nalini or for any of us, or maybe you've got questions about otters for Siva, for Siva is already here, just put them in the chat and you know, maybe we can start looking at them as well. Yeah, Siva was our speaker last week. And after yes. the, at the end of the session, we will uh, unveil our speaker for next week. Yes, we will introduce next week's speaker as well. So, yep. Just gonna leave it on this screen. 55, which is pretty good. So we'll just wait for those people who are having some issues logging on to come in before I start restart proper. Yep. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some new face new names as well. So that's awesome. Oh more. Oh Janice. Janice is joining us this week. Janice Lee from uh, NTU. She's my academic sister. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Where's the donation going to? So this week, we won't know who the donation goes to until uh, a winner is declared for the trivia. So it depends yeah. on the winner. Yeah, so I would suggest you guys uh, get into the uh, trivia sheet, which is here, tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia, right? Go there and put, put your team name and put which beneficiary you want the money to go to. And if you win, then said beneficiary will receive this week's funds. Yep, I've just pasted the address into the main chat box so you guys can copy it and uh, fill it up. Oh so yeah, we excellent. Are, yep, one minute away. I let's start proper. I would introduce our speaker and uh, we can okay. begin. So hi everyone, good afternoon, and welcome to our third SG STEM. Uh, today we have uh, doc, uh, associate professor, assistant professor Nalini. <laughs> Uh, to talk about the research, but I'll give you all a background about um, Nalini. So, um, I first met Nalini when I was in year three in NUS and taking an ecology class. And um, she was, she didn't teach me, but she was the TA in the group next to me. And whatever was going on in the group next to me was always very excited. You can hear the giggling, laughing, and then I would hear from, from um, my classmates that, oh, my TA is so awesome. 
so I was I never got to taught, get taught by Nalini, but my TA was awesome as well. But every time I would keep very quiet during the class just to hear what's going on in the next group as well. So I was like multitasking. Um, but I never really got to speak to a Nalini as well because our times in, in, in NUS didn't really overlap. So when we got a chance to decide on a list of speakers for SG STEM, I think, haha, who can we, who do I always want to listen to? So I thought, hey, Nalini, I want to listen to Nalini talk. So it's an uh, excuse for me to invite um, Nalini to talk about uh, her research. Her research is mostly on insect uh, reproduction as well as recycling. So today she's going to share with us about an, one aspect of her research on use, building an insect army to deal with um, food waste, which is a problem in Singapore. I'll let Nalini talk, talk more about it because I don't want to take up any more time. So uh, Nalini, please. Well, first up, thanks, Kanan and Marcus, for inviting me. And Marcus, I think that introduction had a lot of MSG in it, but uh, thank you nonetheless. So I'll just get started, okay? So here we have, hopefully you guys can see the screen. So I'm going to start off by just giving you guys an idea of why I work on insects. And before we go into the meat of this um, talk, hopefully if you have uh, any trouble following it along or whatever, just put it in the chat and I'll try to address those questions later on. Okay, so this is aimed at a general public, so I'm trying not to have too many sciencey terms, but if I forget, just bring them up later. All right, so first, insects. Now, most of you might not have an idea about insect diversity, so let me just give you a quick illustration. So we as humans, we belong to a group known as vertebrates, which are organisms that have internal skeletal structures. So let me draw your attention to this small icon here, this colored icon. That filled orange icon refers to the number of um, described vertebrate species there are in the world, which is about 45,000. And this little space you see around it, that's the number of un estimated number of undiscovered species. So that's about 5,000, they think, about undiscovered vertebrates in the world. And with, besides these animals, you can also look at, let's say, you know, plants. So these plants has about 240,000 described species over here and about another 60,000 that is unknown. So these are all the organisms that most people associate with biodiversity. But there's a whole field of organisms that are smaller than most people even realize and they're around us. In sharp contrast to what we see here, there are about at least 1 million described species in the world and nearly about 8 million or 5 million undescribed species. So insects actually make up more than half of all the living organisms on this planet. And what is actually interesting is that if you think about the number of humans on this planet, that is about maybe 7 billion, which is 7 followed uh, by you know, a few nine zeros. If you think about the number of um, insects in the world, that's one quintillion individual insects. That is one followed by 19 zeros. So you can imagine just how many insects there are on this planet. And so why are there so many insects? Well, insects play a very important part in the functioning of this planet. Most insects are actually really beneficial and humans actually need insects to live. So do plants and other animals. About 50 to 90% of the human diet itself comes from like flowering plants. And these include grains like wheat and rice. And insect pollination is crucial to most of these fruits and vegetables that we consume. So besides just us, insects are also really important for all the other animals we see on this planet. They are a major source of food for not only birds, but also rodents, bats, and amphibians. And they are an integral part of this food web. So if we have loss of insects, that will inevitably lead to destabilizing entire ecological networks. But of course, how can we also forget some of the most highly prized commodities in human history? Humans have been trading in honey and silk for more than 2,000 years. And these are direct products of insects from bees and silkworms. And insects generally have an economic value, but they also have a scientific and academic value. A lot of scientists use insects to understand fundamental components of the natural and life sciences. 
They're a great tool in genetic research, in biomedical research, in disease management when they study vectors like mosquitoes, for instance. And they're also really important for like forensic sciences. But the part I want to uh, focus on is the role that they play in nutrient cycling. Now, from the industrious dung beetle in the forest to the incessant fruit flies that you might find on your food, to the highly organized leaf cutter ants, there are numerous insect species that play a crucial role in decomposing organic matter and recycling nutrients. So we can actually learn from nature's own recyclers. And that's kind of what me and my research team are doing. We're taking advantage of nature's elegant solution and use it to our own purpose. Specifically, we are going to be using black soldier flies to recycle food waste. Yeah. So why even talk about food waste? Well, because it's actually a big problem in Singapore. For a small country, we generate a lot of food waste. In fact, based on just last year's NEA estimates, we generated nearly about 750,000 tons of food waste. Now, this is actually equivalent to more than 40,000 double-decker buses, right? That's a lot of food waste. And a lot of this waste is actually surplus food that is still fit for human consumption. And unfortunately, much of this is incinerated and less than 20% is actually recycled. So we believe that the use of black soldier flies it actually presents itself as a promising strategy to tackle food waste. How? Well, by insect bioconversion. We give these insects, these larvae, food waste that we generate, and these guys can turn it into uh, fertilizer or animal feed. So what do I mean? I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more. For instance, this is how bioconversion works. So we have an insect here that has discrete life cycles. So it starts out as an egg, it becomes a larvae, which you know, crawls around, then it stops crawling, it becomes a pupa, and then it develops into an adult. Now, at each one of these stages, there are different components. So a female black soldier fly can lay up to 400 to 600 of these eggs, which then are reared in nursery until they can become big enough to put onto food waste. So imagine you put in food waste and these larvae, these guys here, they feed on the food waste to break them down into smaller components. Especially, they also feed on the bacteria that is on the food waste. So it helps to deal with odors. Now these flies at every stage of their life, they are really safe and they don't transmit any diseases, they don't bite. And they are really a very um, I think, a cute organism that can be used for our own purpose. So then you have an output, which is the leftover substrate that can be composted into fertilizer to add to our agriculture, urban cult, uh, agriculture, for instance. And the larvae themselves, once they are ready, oops, sorry, once they have uh, finished eating, they crawl out of the substrate and we can collect them as pupae, which are rich in proteins and fats. And these, this pupae themselves can be used to feed other animals like your chickens for poultry farming or in, to fish in aquaculture. So what started out as food waste can be transformed back into food. So that's what insect bioconversion is about. Now, BSF actually have been used in many parts of the world. So we are not reinventing the wheel here. But the problem is that insect, uh, BSF has mainly been optimized for rural environments, like in um, agricultural countries or in agricultural lands. And so a lot of the industry players and the uh, companies tend to be focused on agricultural waste with respect to recycling. So this is from all other parts of Africa, Europe, Australia, North America. A lot of companies are doing this and scientists as well. But the problem here is that there are challenges in using BSF bioconversion in an urban environment such as Singapore. Now we don't need to remind everyone living here that we don't have a lot of space for agriculture or big land. And so there's a lot of challenges with respect to space. For instance, these larvae, um, these young larvae, they only feed in short depth. That means you can't just dump a whole cart of food into a deep container because these larvae will only feed on the top layers. So you need a lot of big space for and uh, shallow containers 
for BSF, uh, efficient BSF bioconversion with respect to the larvae. And secondly, these adults, they actually need large arenas to mate, and that presents a constraint in a space-limited urban environment. So these are some of the challenges that we've been tackling with the research team. And so our solutions for urban environment have to be focused on larval growth and adult reproduction. And the way we do this is via selective breeding. So the re research facility at uh, NUS, it's been up and running for a while now. Um, and at maximum capacity, it should handle about one ton food waste per day. And um, I'm not sure if you're able to see the, the image on the screen, but there's Dr. Eric Smith there. Uh, he's one of our participants here. And he's actually the project manager running this facility. And they have, at any given time, you can have, if we are at full capacity, nearly 15 million maggots that can be breaking down food waste and more than 200,000 adults that are doing their job producing eggs. So this is possible now because we have managed to optimize some parts of the reproduction. For instance, as I said, in the in farm, rural farm areas, they have these big cages where they select flies and they breed them under big areas. But we are not able to do that in Singapore because we don't have that much space. But thanks to the work in, by some of the people in the group, we have bred Singaporean flies that can mate in small spaces. So not only are they now able to breed in smaller containers, but we can also stack them on top of each other in, uh, in enclosed environments. So this makes these flies, for example, that are shown here, they were actually collected just off the NUS campus, right, in, on Cambridge. So they are local Singaporean flies that have been bred to breed in better conditions. Now, there have been a lot of studies with respect to how to increase egg production and fertility, which refers to the number of eggs that actually hatch. But much of this work has been published on populations in North America and Europe, so they're not actually locally local flies and they're not adapted to local conditions. And there's very little information actually on how different populations might vary. So this is where my lab actually comes into play. We've been looking at what makes these populations differ. Why do some populations produce more eggs? And why are some populations actually, their eggs survive better than other populations? And one of the things we've found is that populations differ with respect to their reproductive traits. Now, for those who don't know, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but any, most insects require two types of organs for making a, the next generation. For instance, they need the gonads as well as accessory glands. Now, so these, for instance, let's just say you need an egg, right? An insect is producing an egg. You also need proteins to feed the egg, to nourish the egg. So these are two types of organs that are required. One is to produce the structure of the gamete, and the other one is to nourish the gamete. And what we find, our work suggests that populations differ with respect to their investment in these kind of structures. So that's why, although our Singapore populations might produce, you know, at first glance, a lot of eggs, more than half of them don't always hatch. So by conducting a research on how to improve local strains, we can improve fertility and optimize black soldier fly reproduction for a local context. So that was a lot of words. So let me just summarize by what the whole research plan is, right? We first try to optimize black soldier flies for an urban environment. We test this out at NUS and we try to see if the substrate can be used to grow plants, whether the food, the animal feed is, um, has is safe enough for consumption. So we have food scientists working on that as well. And we also try to propose un, with a computational approach, what might be the best solution for not only Singapore, but also small communities. So this work is actually a team effort. So um, we have scientists with different backgrounds and we all come with it with our different expertise. So we have Rudolf Meyer, who's uh, working, he's an evolutionary genomics. He's looking at the trait changes and tracking them across the genome of these different populations. Um, we have Hu Tan, who's a botanist, looking at the um, fertilizer, how good it can be for rearing, um, to, have, for, to use in urban agriculture. And then there's me, who's looking at the sex part of things. And then we also have Roman, who is a computational and ecological modeler who takes into account um, carbon dioxide uh, output, um, energy consumption, and to model what is the best solution with respect to black soldier fly use. 
So I'm just gonna end off by giving you a little infographic to kind of highlight the usefulness of these insects, right? They can, in the long run, contribute to our own food security by converting our food waste into more food, right? And we can, it is also one of the most environmentally sustainable processes because it doesn't require high energy in its all nat taking advantage of nature's own solutions. And of course, we are then upcycling food waste. We're changing what used to be burnt into making more food. And we are currently in a pilot project with the Ministry of um, Environment and Water Resources to do a pilot project in Tampines, and it's still um, underway, where we're trying to get local residents to bring their food waste, and we're trying to see if we can provide the eggs and see if it might, it might work at the community level. But this is all like still in uh, early stages. So that, my dear friends, was it. So thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't overwhelm you with a lot of terminology. And I'll be happy to take any questions you have. I'm assuming you guys are clapping because that's what I think. Uh, Nalini, thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. Now, I learned a lot of many, many new things because I'm mainly a vertebrate person, so I don't dwell too much in insects and stuff. But that was really good. And yes, we do have a lot of questions and questions are still coming in. So I'm just going to pick a couple. And uh, yeah, so uh, Ivan wants to know, can BSF maggots be deployed alongside earthworms or do they require different environmental conditions to thrive? Yeah, so the conditions that they need, earthworms have a, they require a certain level of pH and a certain level of humidity and chemical composition that is quite different from food waste. So in fact, food often has higher, let's say salinity, which is salt content, because we tend to put a lot of salt in our food too. And so the composition of where earthworms are used and where larvae, are, black soldier fly larvae are used is quite different. And they're okay. adapted to different environments. Okay. Um, uh, Dawa wants to know, do these maggots break down all types of food waste? And if not, how do we practically separate the food coming in from hawkers, hawker centers? So right now what we've been doing in NUS is uh, working with uh, one of the residential colleges where they get the surplus food and it's all ground up. So each type, of course, bone is often sometimes harder, husks can be harder, um, vegetable cuttings can be harder, but when you grind them up, you increase the surface area and you help aeration and help the um, larvae access the different parts of the food waste. So okay. if, I mean, it's gonna be hard if you put a durian shell there, you guys are not gonna be able to do it. But if you <laughs> okay. pick it up and you put some chakwetiao in there, you grind it all up, maybe it becomes a bit more palatable to them. Okay. So I, I assume chakwetiao is like a personal favorite then for your flies? Not really, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay uh, next question from Audrey. Uh, she wants to know what happens to adult flies after they transition out of their maggot phase? Will there just be a swarm of flies that emerge? And um, if this will prevent their widespread adoption in urban setting? So I assume yeah. this means like if people try to keep them at home, will they be mm -hmm. faced with like an army of flies in the long run? Well, that's the tricky thing. But the thing about these flies is that they don't really like humans. They don't like us. They, it's, and when they emerge as an adult, the only thing that's in, on their mind, like almost any adult, is to have sex. Find a mate, have sex, have offspring, and then they die. So their life okay. cycles as an adult doesn't include feeding, doesn't include finding shelter doesn't include any of the other things, any organism you might think might have as a life history strategy. Their main okay. strategy is to emerge, find a mate, have sex and have more offspring. So okay. when they emerge, they are in swarms, but it tends to be around the areas that they emerge because that's where the other, like males often tend to emerge first, they hang around, females emerge, they have happy times and then the next generation carries on. Okay. So I guess even if you keep them at home, you'll end up with like, kind of like a, a self-sustaining cycle of sorts? Well, it's hard to keep them at home because there are so many factors involved in it. Okay. Because they need large numbers, they need to be um, staggered at different times, you need constant input, and the food has to be some, uh, some level of heterogeneity. And okay. having ca a cages, you know, unless you're dealing with genetically um, selected cultures that can survive in small spaces, most of mm -hmm. them need huge and uh, and closures to okay. thrive. Yeah. Okay, on, on the note of like small spaces, cause there is a question here. 
-hmm. I saw it a while ago. I think I've, I've lost it now. But um, with, uh, you said that these Singaporean flies have, uh, they've been kind of bred to live in smaller spaces and stuff. So does that affect them in any way, like ecologically? Like are they smaller or do they eat less? No, not necessarily. They, just... Okay. So they, they just breed in smaller spaces, but as far as we can tell, the, the output is about the same as the other culture, the control population where they started off from before they were selected. And okay. to be honest, right now, what we are looking at is there are so many different strains and there's very little research that says how different strains, what they are adapted for. So in the lab, we're trying to see if we can create like a, a line of supplies okay. based off a, of a Singaporean strain that mm -hmm. is not only able to do well in, in, with respect to, um, let's say, larval development, but also maybe it's better able to deal with thermal fluctuations. There's so many okay. different things that we can do. And this uh, research is still in, in its infancy. So there's okay. some questions we would like to answer, but not yet. Okay, um, I think I'll take three more questions. I've, I've got still about 700 messages, but I'm gonna take three more questions. Um, Ivan wants to know what happens to uh, inedible items that are fed to the black soldier fly? Because sometimes the food waste will have plastic mixed in yeah. it. So have these maggots shown any signs of being able to consume plastic, like mealworms and wax moth caterpillars? So no, these guys don't like plastic and the plastic basically just floats to the top of the um, container where you have the larvae because the larvae are constantly moving up and down, up and down, and anything that they don't eat just gets sieved up. So it's okay. just on the top. Yeah, they don't eat these guys, uh, this plastic. Okay. Um, so I guess while we're getting rid of the food stuff, we cannot use them for plastic control then? No, so the, another major part, which I didn't mention, is comes with education. So okay. any kind of food waste comes with education. So that means educating the public to say that when you throw food away, in, if you want to recycle it, you need to remove the plastic tag. Plastic, on it. yeah. And even better, don't buy things that have plastic on them. Yes. Right? And bring your own bags and get, don't take stuff that's already packaged into six apples in a plastic bag. You bring your own bag and take the six, you know, free apples that are lying around. I agree. Everyone, that was a PSA. Reduce your plastic use as much as you're reducing your food waste. Yes. Okay? Yes. Okay, uh, another question. Oh, I like this question. Do they eat any kind of food, greasy, oily, curry, spicy stuff? <laughs> well, what we've seemed to find, and, and Eric can chime in if he, um, if he has something to add as well, is that actually local food tends to be quite a bit of, has a, a lot of uh, salt rather than mm. the spice. Um, okay. The flies themselves, the larvae themselves are fine, but the, um, the residue, the compost, that becomes a bit tricky when we want to use it for fertilizer because of the high salt content. Yeah, they, okay. As far as I know, they don't dislike spice, but I think spice is a, uh, <laughs> not everyone appreciates the same level anyway, that okay. applies to every organism. Ah, it's good. I guess it's good that flies to have like a, a spice level they work with. And I'm sure you can have little pots of like spicy flies and non-spicy flies. <laughs> Actually, I think Eric might have something to add. Oh, um, I, I had to move into another room because we've got our three-year-old who is having a really good time. But um, <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to add on to what Nalini was saying. Um, they really will go for anything, uh, salty, oily, spicy, because they don't, uh, I don't know this for sure, and I, there may be research to be done on this, but um, to my knowledge, they don't have the same uh, taste receptors. Mm. Mammals, uh, feel the capsation in chilies. This is why they are bird, uh, the seeds are dispersed by birds because birds can't, um, can't taste the capsation. They don't feel the heat. Mm -hmm. So that's a defense mechanism of the chili plant to ensure that mammals aren't dispersing the chilies, only birds are, because there's something in our gut that will break down the seeds. Anyways, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, a side note. But, um, but yeah, basically they'll eat anything. One thing that we've noticed in the facility is if the food is a little bit too oily, um, and this doesn't have to be just from the cooking oil, this can be uh, other lipids. Um, mm -hmm. We've noticed this in oils that are in biscuits, uh, that they do not like it because it's our suspicion that it gets in the way of their, um, their breathing to be 
uh, Frank. I, I think the oil might clog up their their um, spiracles, and mm -hmm. so that makes it difficult. So they want to climb out and 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 escape, basically. Uh, but um, under most circumstances, we have fed them oily food, and and things are fine. But that's the only that's the only thing that we've noticed about their diet that they really are somewhat averse to. Anyways, back to all of all of the rest of you. Thanks, Eric. Welcome. Okay, uh, let's do two more questions. Um, uh, uh, can other species of flies be used or are black soldier flies the prime species? Uh, I think this is main, meant for more of a global scale. So if mm -hmm. let's say, if we want to do this thing on an international scale, uh, are there any other kind of like fly species that would be useful? And also since they are Singapore flies, uh, how, will they have like uh, climate change, uh, not climate change, like will they have climate differences like summer and winter? Well, actually, uh, seasonal differences actually. Black soldier flies are found all over the world. And okay. we, are, we are the ones that are a bit later to the game. There have been no, numerous countries that have had black soldier flies uh, used in food waste recycling for years. And as I mentioned, though, they have mainly been in rural environments, not in, and using agricultural waste, not necessarily food waste. So that's the big difference. So the thing in Singapore is that our, what we are using it for was not, it's not for agricultural waste, it's for food waste. And food waste has other stuff in it, right? We have condiments in it. We, as I mentioned a couple of times, we have salt levels. Um, the, the consistency of food waste also is quite different from that of agricultural waste. So that's the challenge here that we are trying to do. These flies are often locally adapted. Most populations of any kind of organism tends to be locally adapted to the environment. So that's why we are starting off with Singapore flies rather than just getting a strain from overseas. But what we are doing is we are studying these strains from overseas and seeing what works for them and trying to manipulate that for local flies. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's that good then. So, that so this thing's... Yeah, uh, so I guess this can this thing can be done globally then. Since oh yeah, it's, it's been here. it's been yeah going on for a while. Oh, okay, so uh, let's take the last question and then we'll move on to other things. Uh, this is from uh, Hang Chong. Does Singapore Food Agency allow black soldier flies, uh, which have been fed with post consumer food waste, to be in turn mm -hmm. fed to animals reared for animal consumption? And if not, what are the best practices and or regulatory frameworks that would allow that? So that's actually what we are having. Um, we have a task force right now with uh, NEA and uh, the Singapore Food Agency. That's part of the research that's actually going on. We've got um, people from the food sciences as well to try and see what are the um, effects of this food cycle, meaning how safe it is for human consumption. It has been shown in many places that it's safe for animal consumption and that okay. actually it is fine to go back into the food cycle, but it really depends on country, each country's regulations. And so Singapore is still, as I said, in the infancy of PSF work, and we are working with statutory boards in trying to figure that out. Okay, that, that's good. Then hopefully, you know, they, they'll be able to make this a commonplace. Uh, well, that's the hope, but I mean, the, there's still a lot of questions left to answer, and that's kind of what I need. That's my job. <laughs> that's good then. Um, I think that is uh, all for questions. We still have a bunch of questions. I think uh, Eric can answer them in the chat as, as we go along since yeah. you've, been, you've been targeted by Nalini earlier. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. <laughs> I, I apologize, but I have to leave um, the, the Zoom Oh, yeah, now. sure. So, but thank you for sure. having me. If you guys have any questions, you can um, feel free to continue uh, typing them out in the chat, and Kandan and Marcus will send them to me, and I might be able to give them some answers that they might be able to share. Or <laughs> oh, you move on to our trivia section next. Please uh, join me in thanking Nalini. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Nalini. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Nalini. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, people don't. All right, so please don't go away. Uh, thanks, Nalini and Eric. So, um, if you want to contact Nalini directly, if you've got burning questions, you can reach Nalini on Twitter. Her handle is uh, at Nalini underscore Dr. P. Uh, you could go to her DBS, uh, NUS DBS website and she, uh, he, her email address is next. So before we go on to uh, our next segment, we have uh, a poll. So we are now in the middle of our 
uh, SG STEM, Circuit Breaker, Talk and Trivia. And uh, we're glad everyone is uh, logging in to, to listen uh, to all our local um, STEM speakers. So uh, we are now thinking about what's going to happen after uh, the Circuit Breaker. Would we want to continue doing this? Kana and Ivory would very much like to continue. But we mm -hmm. know that once people start going back to work, it, the timing on Friday afternoons might not be great for everyone. So we're going to launch a poll now to ask um, what would you want to continue um, logging on to listen to STEM speakers speak and what would be the best time for this? So now you will see a poll uh, question being flashed up on your screen. So yep. please vote what's the best time, or even if you are not likely to join, know the brutal answer for us, uh, let us know too. Yeah, so uh, we've got about, yeah, we'll, we'll wait till we got about 80, 90% people have voted, you know, democracy, so keep voting. Yeah. So, so far we've got about 65% have voted, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say which is leading, I don't want to like, you know, influence your votes, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we're also very glad that the retention rate for sign up is very high. So this, uh, for the past few weeks, it's um, 80 to 90 uh, percent. People, people who sign up actually attended. Today, I think we had close to 90 percent um, people who sign up who attended. Mm -hmm. so thank you yep. very much. Uh, please share this with your friends too. So if you really enjoy this. Yep. So we were 84 percent have voted. If anyone else is listening and you haven't voted yet, go make your votes. Your votes will count all the time, everywhere. Okay. Uh, Let's let's give it like maybe yeah you know what okay so uh, shall we share the results so that people see what what they voted for yeah yeah, yeah. yes please sure so uh, as you guys can see uh, weekday evening is uh, top choice as followed by Saturday afternoon and then Saturday morning so the thing is obviously this is not uh, we're not going to do one poll we're going to do a poll like every week because we have different people attending for different sessions so we're going to do a poll every week for the rest of Circuit Breaker which is another two more sessions. And then at the end of it, we will compile and then we will see which is uh, the most preferred timing. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. And then uh, we can uh, fix uh, a day and we'll just let you guys know when we are going to continue it. Because uh, as much as it's going to be kind of difficult for people once work starts, I really want to keep this thing going because I think science communication is very important, especially in Singapore. And, um, and I think you guys have been a lovely bunch. And uh, yeah, I think you guys will enjoy it as well. So, uh, yeah. Let's move on Let's, to our trivia. Uh, yes, we will go on to our trivia. I hope you guys have uh, made your team names and stuff. Okay, let's flash the um, trivia instructions. Um, yes, I was yeah. just gonna do that, yeah. Uh, let me see, share screen, and there we go. Yes, you guys can see my screen. All right, so for those who are late uh, to joining us, so we are starting the trivia. And this section of the trivia is um, so for raising um, funds for uh, local environmental and animal uh, nonprofits. So if you wish to, you could donate a uh, dollar to uh, the PayPal num uh, website or the PayNow number on the screen. So whoever yep. wins the trivia, would get to decide on the beneficiary for the trivia pot. So as of before we started, it was eleven dollars. But I think money uh, donations oh, have, yeah. been, have been coming. Have been coming in. I, I, I think we are like uh, we have hit ninety dollars now. That's awesome. All right. So yep. you go on to the next slide. Uh, we'll talk about um, rules for the trivia. So there will be four rounds, and the acronym for plus one bonus, uh, including one bonus round. So the acronym for this week is NGO plus a bonus. So NGO stands for non-government organization, but that's not uh, the segment uh, topics. So uh, everyone is supposed to update the live trivia Google Sheet with your team name as well as your beneficiary. So it's tinyurl uh, sg slam the dash trivia. I'm going to type it in tinyurl.com yep. sg stem dash trivia. So if you haven't updated it, so this indicates you are in the game and your beneficiary is listed. So we'll follow an honor code. We're gonna flash out the questions on the screen. Uh, write it down on a piece of paper or type it out on a separate program or your phone. And uh, there's no looking up your answers. You can play in a team, but uh, you only submit your answers to us in the end for verification. 
So take a photo mm -hmm. of it or email your answer to sgstem.talktrivia at gmail.com at the end of the quiz before we share the answers. Uh, yep. And also, I just want to say you guys can form teams. So if you've got friends or on here, you guys can form a team together and you all can discuss privately. I think you can discuss privately and you can uh, put, a, put your names up because I know a few people have been playing in teams. So we encourage it, you know, more brains better than one. So form teams and stuff. Marcus, how is the trivia sheet looking? Okay, let me take a look at the sheet. I looked at it right before, but Sin Wei is saying that the sheet is... Oh, I think everyone can't... Wait, uh, please use the active sheet on the Google sheet. I, whatever's late, listed 0508, it's last week's one, but I've created an active sheet. Are you guys able to access it? I've created it, I think, yesterday or the day before. Okay. Uh, let's go to that sheet. And also, uh, I, th I think Eric is sticking around to answer more questions. Uh, th thanks for that, Eric. So if you guys still have questions, you can uh, send it over. You can send it in the chat or you can send, uh, send it to pri privately to Eric. Yeah. Oh, you mean just the title? All right. So the title is old. Oh, thanks for pointing it out. But we can continue, continue as, as, as we go along. Okay. So, yeah. um, I think the title is ready to start. Yep. So uh, I hope you guys, in, in the time while we're checking stuff, I hope you grab your pen, your paper, and your quiz partner. And the first topic is news. So let's see what has been happening around the world recently, aside from COVID-19. So question one, which mid-Cretaceous dinosaur's tail was recently found and described, making it the only known largely aquatic dinosaur? which mid-Cretaceous dinosaurs, mid dinosaurs' tail was recently found and described, making it the only known largely aquatic dinosaur. So uh, about the picture, some of them are not dinosaurs. I could not find a purely Cretaceous dinosaur one. So I've taken uh, some time and I've crossed out all the non-dinosaurs. So marine reptiles, flying reptiles, normal reptiles, invertebrates have all been crossed out. So um, yeah. If you guys think that the dinosaur is featured on this list, go for it. If not, you can throw me a completely different dinosaur as well, if it's not on the list. So, meet Cretaceous dinosaur tail. Okay, uh, let's go to question two. Question two. What is the name given to the social distancing robot patrolling Bishan Amokyo Park? What is the name given to the social distancing robot patrolling Bishan Amokyo Park? Okay, and um, let's go to question three. Oh, by the way, right, if you guys need me to go back to a question, just put it in the chat, I'll do it, right? Uh, let's go back to question one after this. I've got a request for that. Okay, cool. Uh, a woman was recently arrested and charged with being a public nuisance and violating COVID-19 laws in Singapore. She was seen in a video claiming to be a blank, meaning a person who rejects the government, police, and any form of authority. What was this person claiming to be? It's kind of like filling the, uh, fill the blanks, like a closed passage. So yeah, what was this person claiming to be? And this word means a person who rejects the government, police, and any form of authority. While you guys are writing that, I'm just going to show question one again. Which mid Cretaceous dinosaur's tail was recently found and described, making it the only known largely aquatic dinosaur? Okay. By the way, you guys can just drop me like the genus name, which is like, you know, the first part of the name or even half the name so people know what you're talking about. Doesn't have to be like the whole thing. Question four, a gas leak from a LG chemical plant in Vishakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh, India, resulted in the death of 13 people and more than a thousand were taken ill. What was being produced in the chemical plant? A gas leak from an LG chemical plant in Vishakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh, India, resulted in the death of 13 people and more than a thousand were taken ill. 
what was being produced in the chemical plant, A, battery fluids, B, herbicide, C, pesticide, and D, polystyrene. Okay, so moving on to question five. Awareness days highlights. Awareness days highlights issues to raise awareness and mobilize actions. Today is the 15th anniversary of what annual awareness day? So you guys know, right? That's like the whole like something awareness day, something commemorative day. So today is a 15th day, 15th uh, anniversary of one annual awareness day. Okay. And um, moving on. So NGO, the G stands for geography. Good luck. Which country has the most volcanoes? Which country in the world has the most volcanoes? Question two. Which is the tallest mountain in Wales? Which is the tallest mountain in Wales? A, Scaffold Pike, B, Snowden, C, Ben Nevis, D, Sleeve Donut. Which is the tallest mountain in Wales? Oh, by the way, these pictures are of the corresponding mountain names. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't throw in like random mountain pictures, random names. And you know who came up with this question? No one needs to know, man. No one needs to know. Question three. Name the continent where you can find the world's longest mountain range. Name the continent where you can find the world's longest mountain range. And as always, the picture is always a clue or even the answer. So yeah. And moving on to question four. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, consists of 10 member states, with Indonesia being the largest by land area. What is the second largest? The ASEAN group consists of 10 member states, with Indonesia being the largest by land area, which is the second largest country. And the last question for uh, geography, what is this country? I'll let you know that Marcus came up with this question. And when I looked at the country, I was like, what? And then when I went to look it up, I was like, huh? I don't think I would have recognized it. I, I, feel, I feel like the only two countries that I would recognize immediately would be uh, the United Kingdom and Singapore, if you consider the United Kingdom as a country of its own. I think those are the only two I'd recognize. So, yeah. So, you guys, if you guys got any votes, right, take it up with Marcus. Uh, this is real and it is somewhere in the west of Singapore. Literally, everything is west of Singapore. <laughs> if you look at a map with uh, the UK in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, that'll work. Okay, and for the last part for NGO is organism. Because, you know, last week we felt like we were asking too many creature questions, so this week we are going to, like, tone it down, he says. So let's see what we have for organism. Question one, what is the name or cultivar of Singapore's national flower? What is the name or cultivar of Singapore's national flower? We used the word cultivar last week, which apparently is, like, breed in botany. So, yeah. Because I think last week we had a question on apples. So cultivar. You know what we should do, Marcus? We should make up like a little glossary section of all the, the, the new words we learn while making up quizzes and we should share them at some point. Yeah, definitely. This is what the host learned while they made that came up with this quiz. Now I learned so much when I make these quizzes because I try to give questions which I already know the answer to, but still I want to check it out and I'm like, oh look, 
fun facts for you all. So yeah. Question two. Botanically, a berry is a fleshy fruit with a, without a pit or a singular stone produced from a single flower containing one ovary. Which of the following is a botanical berry? So you get berries, but some of them are true berries. Other of them, some of them are berries by name. So you could say I'm asking for a true berry. Which of the following is a true botanical berry? A, strawberry, B, blueberry, C, mulberry, D, blackberry. When I wrote this question, I saw the name berries. I saw the word berry so many times. At the end of it, I was like, I feel like I'm spelling it wrong. So yeah. The clue is in the question itself. Yeah. A berry is a fleshy fruit without a pit. A pit is like a singular stone. So like uh, a mango seed is considered a pit or a stone because it's one. So yeah. Okay, uh, question three. The saga tree is a common naturalized tree in Singapore with more than 700 trees across the island. Its bright red seeds were used as units of weight measures in the past. How many saga seeds to a gram? The saga tree is a common naturalized tree in Singapore with more than 700 trees across the island. Its bright red seeds were used as units of weight measures in the past. How many seeds to a gram? So I got the number 700 from the excellent website that NPARCs have. It's called trees.sg. It plots more than 500,000 trees in Singapore and that's how I counted uh, more than 700 saga trees. Question four. We, we like asking this kind of like, you know, weird versus questions. Last week was like ducks and horses. This week it's elephants and giraffes. Which is heavier? the trunk of an elephant or the neck of a giraffe. I feel like that is a very judgmental giraffe there. So yeah, he will judge you if you get it wrong. Which is heavier, the trunk of an elephant or the neck of a giraffe? Um, let's go to the last question. Oh, okay. To which species does the oldest known tree in Singapore belong to? This tree is estimated at about 360 years old. To which species does the oldest known tree in Singapore estimated at about 360 years old belong to? By the way, the picture is not a clue. It is just an old tree I found on the internet. I'll put it out here now. The rest of them are all notable uh, trees that you find locally in Singapore. Okay. Uh, does anyone need any question repeating? Anything in the chat, Marcus? Uh, no, nothing. Excellent. Maybe to, to clarify the last question, we want to compare an uh, uh, African savanna elephant versus uh, a Rothschild's giraffe. Mm, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's stick with uh, African elephants and giraffes. Okay, so... Right. Uh, ooh. You guys ready for the... Oh, uh, yes, self-mark, so right? Someone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Self-mark, right. Uh, let's do this. Ooh. Question one for news or the answer. Spinosaurus was the recently found dinosaur. I mean, dinosaur whose tail was recently found. So they find that it is uh, long and pedal-like, kind of like a newt or a crocodile. So there's this excellent uh, GIF from uh, NetGeo where you can see the tail moving. Uh, no, you guys need not send us the answers first. You guys can just self-mark. Uh, you can send us the answers later. We will uh, let you know when. Okay, Spinosaurus was the answer. Question two, Spot is the name for this dog. So, um, I know that it's confusing there because on the dog's body, you've got Boston Dynamics and you've got uh, Lima 002. So Boston Dynamics created this dog and it was, uh, it, it can go through stairs, uh, we go through stairs, it can go on stairs and places that most wheeled robots won't be able to. And this dog, fun fact, has 360 degree vision and it says obstacle avoidance. So you cannot stand in its path right, if you see it along Bishan or Mercure Park. And it speaks in a polite female voice. But does it have a voice now? Oh, that's adorable. I didn't know that a voice. I just know that it will kind of like make loud noises so it doesn't sneak up on you. 
and it scares the dogs. And uh, question three, the woman claimed she was a sovereign, which means a person who rejects the government, police, and any form of authority. And from what I understand, this is a, is a term which is pretty much used in like parts of the US and not uh, very much else in other parts. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat though. So she claimed she was a sovereign. Question four, uh, the LG chemical plant that resulted in the death of 13 people in Vaisak in Andhra Pradesh, India was making polystyrene. Polystyrene is the answer. And uh, five, today is Endangered Species Day. It's the 15th Endangered Species Day. So yeah, fun fact, today is also a dinosaur day, but then there are two dinosaur days and uh, one of them is today, the other one is coming soon. I might, that may be a question the next time, when is the next dinosaur day? So yep, uh, let's go to the next one, geography. Indonesia has the most volcanoes. They have over 400 volcanoes and out of which 127 are still active. And these 127 active volcanoes, they account for one third of the world's active volcano population number. So yeah, Indonesia, and that is uh, Krakatoa exploding. Uh, oops. Question two, the tallest mountain in Wales is Snowdon. Uh, all of the other mountains mentioned were also from the United Kingdom. Scaffold Pike is the tallest mountain in England. Sleeve Donut is the tallest mountain in Northern Ireland. Ben Nevis is the tallest mountain in Scotland which is also the tallest mountain in the UK. So Snowden is the tallest mountain in Wales. I have climbed it, the views are amazing when it's not foggy, you know, like you get this kind of like a clear day once a year, so yeah. Uh, question three, the continent with the longest mountain range is South America. And uh, the mountain range in question is Andes and it's 7,000 kilometers long. And uh, it runs through seven countries. Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. So South America. And question four, the second largest by land area in the ASEAN group is Myanmar. Indonesia has 1.9 uh, million square kilometers and Myanmar has about 676,000. Fun fact for you guys. There's so many fun facts now, I've made like entire list, so yeah. Fun fact, Indonesia has got more land area than the next three countries combined. So the next three countries are Myanmar, Thailand, and Malaysia, and Indonesia has more land area than these three guys combined. Okay. And this is the UAE. Uh, we also have a little globe showing you how it fits there. So this country is the United Arab Emirates. So the fun fact, the, the, something that looks like an eye on the goat, uh, it's actually a lake, and there's an island in the lake. Something like that. Now that you see it, right, I, I cannot unsee the goat. <laughs> it looks like a goat wearing a dress as well. So yeah, excellent. Uh, let's go to the next question. Organism. The name of Singapore's national flower is Vendor Miss Joquim. And this flower, or this cultivar, was chosen on 15 April 1981 by then Minister for Culture S. Danabalan to be our national flower. Fun fact, Singapore is the only country in the world that has a hybrid plant as its national flower. So the Vendam is Joaquin is uh, actually a hybrid. And it's notoriously hard to grow, I was told by Prof Newton. Oh, okay. See, I thought like, I thought, like every, when I was young, I thought every country had orchids and we just had this one, then I realized that every country had its own flowers and not just orchids everywhere. Aha, uh -huh. a botanical berry, you'll probably hate me for this question. A botanical berry, berry is a blueberry, right? So um, other botanical berries are bananas, pumpkins, and avocados. Oh, no, wait, not an avocado. Avocado is not a berry. And uh, the other options, a strawberry is an accessory fruit similar to apples and pears, where the main part of the fruit isn't, doesn't come from the ovary. It comes from the surrounding tissue. Uh, Mulberries are multiple fruits that just grow together and they just form one mass. And uh, another fine example of this is a pineapple, or should I say another pine example of this is pineapple. Uh, blackberry is an aggregate fruit, which is a lot of tiny fruits stuck together. And uh, another aggregate fruit that we probably know is soursop. So a blueberry is the only true berry. 
And four saga seeds make one gram. Four saga seeds to a gram. And uh, let's go to the next one. The neck of a giraffe is actually heavier than the trunk of an elephant. Actually, it's twice as heavy, despite they both being around the same size. They're both about six to seven feet in length, uh, varying of individuals. But a giraffe's neck weighs about 272 kilograms, while the elephant weighs about 140 kilograms, the elephant's trunk. So the giraffe's neck is heavier. And also the giraffe has the exact number of neck bones as we do, seven, just they are huge. And, Guess uh, how they got the weight of uh, the trunk of an African elephant. So there were a couple of, so we have the references there, a couple of dead African elephants. And this author basically uh, cut them up because an African elephant is too heavy for any scale. So this authors cut them up into various parts and weighed the parts individually. Quite morbid, but that's how they did it. Yeah. What, what about the blood? Doesn't blood weight be affected? Fresh. Frozen. Oh, fresh. Okay. No, I think they were fresh, I think, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, the oldest known tree in Singapore is the Shoria, which is actually this Shoria in the picture. And um, fun fact, again, so many fun facts for you guys. I love this. Fun fact for you, this is also probably the tallest tree in Singapore. And it's about as tall as a 20-story uh, apartment block. So it is the oldest and potentially the tallest as well. So Shoria and the other trees, right? They are all kind of uh, also the older ones as well. I took them all from a list. So the one of the older Tembusus is obviously the one at Botanical Gardens, the one of the low hanging branch. Uh, there's also a Bodhi tree in a Buddha temple. And uh, there's also an Angsana. I think the Angsana was at, oh, it was at one of the hotels. I can't remember which one, it was at one of the hotels in Singapore as well. So these are all old trees, the Shoria being the oldest. Okay, and now we come to the bonus round. Yep, so at this point, uh, I would request everyone to tally up your scores on your, uh, on whatever sheet you're doing. Uh, update it on the shared Google sheet, and we will talk about the wages. So the Shoria tree was, I think it's found at Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. Yes, it was. Thanks for bringing that up. Yep. So I would recap how the wager works. So after you have tallied out all your scores, the bonus round works in a way that if you are slightly behind, this is your chance where you can catch up. So you get to see everyone's score. So you wager your point for the next round. So our next bonus question is something based on the top. Right? So uh, you wager your point. So then the maximum points you can wager is your total points you have. You can wager from one point to the maximum point you have. So for example, you got all correct, it's 25 points, right? Uh, sorry, 15 points. Um, and then you would gain the number of points you wager if your answer to the bonus question is correct, but you would lose the number of points if you are wrong, right? So please fill in your wager amount. So if you've got 15 points and you wager 15 points, uh, if you get the bonus question correct, you get 30 points in total. If you get the bonus question wrong, you get zero points. I see most, almost everyone wagering their full points. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we are waiting for Fibbers, uh, Tommy, uh, Wandru, and Barb. And also, Barb right, just, just a reminder, you can only wager points you already have. Do not over-wager your points. I will say this every week. But Marcus and I have this like spiel that we give you guys every week about the wagers. So, yep. Oh, by the way, right, and also, uh, since we are waiting for people, if you guys got any, like, topics you want us to put in the quiz, right, just drop us a message. Like, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We have our own site. You can email us. So if you guys got any quiz questions or quiz topics that you want us to put, you know, like, maybe you really, really like, uh, I'm trying to think of something really cool and quick, uh, sea creatures or marine invertebrates, tell us. We'll put it in the quiz. Okay, I see a request for native wildlife. All right, so I think yep. everyone who is in the game has updated. Uh, awesome. So we have sure. 20 minus 2. 18 teams, 17 teams okay. playing. All right, okay. and majority are playing for Acres. We've got Vet uh, Conservation International. We've got Climate con Conversations. 
uh, WRSCF project developers. All right, so let's review. Excellent. Let's go. Bonus question for this today, this session. Oh, oh, I almost gave the answer away there. What are the insects used by Nalini's team to combat food waste? What are the insects used by Nalini's team to combat food waste? As always, the picture may have the clue. I don't know, I haven't looked at the picture yet, you know. It, you know, it might have the clue, you know, it might, just maybe. So yeah, what are the insects used by Nalini's team to combat food waste? No scrolling up of the chat to look at the answers, so they're there. Yeah. We did mention it a few times. It was mentioned in the chat so many times on today. So, yeah. <laughs> Eric suggested must use scientific name. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I'm sure you, yeah, go for it. Well, well if, if we see a scientific name, right, in addition to the common name, we'll give you one extra point. Okay. Yeah, well, let's, let's give it the one extra point. Because I think I mentioned the scientific name once or twice in my promos. I think when I was promoting to my entomology group, guys, so I used it then. And I think I used it once on Twitter as well. So, yeah. And right. I so, if you guys have got slide two, is it a oh, slide as well? Excellent. So, yeah. So, um, if they have it, do we get, do we reveal the answer? Uh, we will let everyone uh, write the down first because they might have to think about the scientific name. Yeah. Y'all better be thinking and not be scrolling. Yeah, the scientific name hint uh, talks about the body of the fly. The body of the fly has a part that is shiny or translucent. And that's where okay. we get the specific epithet of the, of the fly, the name. All right, everyone. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Let us know if you're not. Yeah. So I'm just looking at like, 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 like you know, some of the, the, the cameras which are open. I see a lot of confident faces and stuff. Everyone's smiling and nodding. So excellent. So uh, yeah, let's, let's go. Shall I, Marcus? Yes, please. All right. So the insects used by Nalini's team for food waste reduction is the black soldier fly or black soldier flies or maggots of black soldier flies. What's the scientific name, Marcus? Oh, something illuminates. Maybe Eric can unmute and tell us. Yeah, wait, I'll, I'll unmute Eric. Hermetia right, Eric, what Eleusins. is this? Oh, Hermetia Eleusins or Hermetia Eleusins, I've heard it pronounced that way. Yes. What am I supposed Excellent. to be <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So um, that is the last question for, for today. Right. So if uh, you have the scientific name, you give yourself a bonus point, but we would definitely, we will of course check um, once you submitted it as well. So could you please um, submit your answers to the email? Yep, it's on the screen as well. So uh, yep, and you can update your scores over there as well. So I've copied the name of the, f uh, the scientific name in the chat box and I'm typing the email address you could send it yep. to. I've already got a few emails coming in as well. So as usual, we will announce a unofficial winner from a quick glance and probably later in the day or tomorrow, we will uh, announce the official winner. I mean, so far, you know, like the unofficial winner has always been the official winner as well. So yeah, you guys are very honest. Yeah. Oh, we've well, got someone you. who's got 24 points, Jen. All right. Seems it seems that our unofficial winner today is Jen. Jen that, that Tan, was right? Congratulations. I see you oh, with a Hondu in the background. Excellent. So um, the beneficiary that Jen has selected is WRCF. Of course, we will check the uh, answers just to be sure. Yep. And we would update the website uh, with the donation uh, receipt once everyone's ready. So thanks yes. for joining us today. We're going to review our next speaker uh, in our next slide. Oh yeah, that's also a trivia part if you guys haven't done it yet. Oh, yeah, yesterday, uh, uh, the last week, we got uh, contributions all the way after a few hours of the talk. Yeah, so I, think, next... I think uh, we had stuff coming in at like up till 10, 11 p.m. as well. So yeah.
So joining us next week is uh, Dr. Sean Lam from NTU, uh, Nanyang Technological University. So Sean is a senior lecturer at NTU Asian School of the Environment, and he's also the president of the Nature Society Singapore. So um, Sean is uh, will be talking. He actually hasn't told us what he wants to talk about yet, so that'll be a surprise, I think. But once he has updated us, we'll update the, the posters and we'll uh, put it up as well. So please, uh, the sign-up link is already active. We also have a Facebook group and a website at the top where you could uh, go to to find out more information about this. So, yep. and also okay. if you guys haven't, I'm just gonna, if you guys have not followed us on Facebook, on the Facebook group or our website, go and sign up for it. Okay, so you guys will get all the updates from there. And um, you know what? Yeah, Marcus, let's let's do the Wi-Fi. All right. So I'm I'm muting everyone. Turn on your cameras if you wish to be featured, and the Wi-Fi is also posted on the website uh, after every event. Yep, more and more. Yeah, we just give, we'll just give everyone some time to like get their cameras on. Yeah, thanks for being part of the STEM community. Okay, so I am going to take the photo. We've got 15, uh, no, 36, or oh, 15 non-video participants. So yep. uh, say cheese at your camera. One, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just take a few so that uh, we don't have people <laughs> blinking. Yeah, sometimes right, I have to right join on. pictures. All right, so thanks very much. Uh, if you enjoy the session, see you guys next week um, when Sean is talking about uh, more about his work. Yep. Oh, yeah. And also, yeah, and also I'll just uh, tell you guys, we do this every Friday. So we'll be here again next week, same time, same place as well. So we'll see you then. And till then, remember, stay safe, stay home. And remember to stay connected with science. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So is it that uh, people didn't want to stay after to ask more questions? There were uh, a few I, questions in the chat box, but yep. anyone who's interested can ask more questions. As yeah. Well. Oh, there, there, there is. Yeah, there are questions coming in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is it? Do you? Oh, is it cool if we do this for a few minutes more? For, yeah, for sure. Let's go ahead. I'm interested oh. to know too. Oh, okay. So yeah, let's let's do it not via typing, but I mean, I guess I don't know. There's not too many of us, right? Yeah, we could just talk. Everyone's unmuted, so I think. Sh um, Shin Long has a question. Yeah. Unless it is easier to do yep, it that, with typing. Okay. It's up to you, Eric. It's so up to you. If, if, you uh, if you want, you can talk about it. Or if not, you can uh, type All it. All right. Uh, I'll scroll through some of these questions that they had. Um, let's see. Uh, so the main difference there, I think, talked about that. Um, Maybe you could start with the, la the last question because Shin Long is uh, present oh, yeah. on the video yeah. chat now. So that'd be great. Oh, hi, Hong Chong. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay, so the <laughs> uh, there's currently one farm in Singapore using black soldier flies. Any idea on the scale of the project thus far? Where does it get its food waste as of now? Um, so I'll start with that part. Uh, that farm uh, would be the one that's at Citizen Farm called Insecta. Um, before I started this project two years ago, uh, the lab that um, we, we tried working with them apparently, but somehow that relationship fell through. So we don't have much contact with them, uh, to be honest. Um, I know that their scale is not very big. I think it's probably no bigger than the scale that we're at, which is at its peak, we are recycling. Um, before, the, before the circuit breaker, we had recycled um, 1,600 kgs over the course of 10 days. Um, and I know that Insecta is not doing that volume to my knowledge. Um, I could be wrong. If anyone knows differently, please feel free to correct me. Um, 
And I know that they are using a more diversified uh, feedstock. We are using food waste, which means kitchen food waste and fully prepared food that has not been eaten. Uh, I know that they use um, what is called okara, which is the leftover after bean curd. It's the pulp that's left over after you are making bean curd and um, soy milk, things like that. Um, and also using spent grains, which are the grains left over after the beer brewing process. Those are uh, something, those are things that we don't use, um, but they are very commonly used throughout uh, Southeast Asia because it's a very stable, predictable feedstock for black soldier fly. They do okay with them, not great, um, but it's reliable, it's, it's, homogenous, they know exactly what they're getting every single time, and they know what they're going to get out every single time. Uh, and I believe they are also giving the their black soldier flies vegetable waste, like farm waste that they have, the, the horticultural waste, as we call it. Um, but other than that, I don't know exactly how big they are, just because of um, we're not really working together, which is actually I mean, in my opinion, kind of a tragedy. Um, but uh, the second part of that, what are some challenges you see using these black soldier flies here in Singapore? Um, farms might not be something viable in landscapes. Yeah, so land space is a big issue. Um, Nalini did talk about getting them to be more productive in smaller spaces, uh, specifically when it comes to reproduction. Uh, in smaller spaces uh, and she usually uses the joke that we're trying to turn them into good Singaporeans that can raise families in very small spaces. Um, but uh, so the reason for that is they find their mates in flight. So the male will be perched land, they, they'd be at rest, landed somewhere, um, sitting, waiting. And it will see a female flying above. And uh, they, they're very visual. They do not fly at night. They only fly uh, during the daytime. And to get successful fertilization of their eggs, they actually require a certain amount of ultraviolet light. So uh, it's difficult to get good egg production under, say, normal indoor lighting because all of the ultraviolet light has been filtered out for our safety. Uh, so they only fly around in daylight and that means they only mate in, in the daylight too. So the male is sitting waiting, the female flies above, he sees her, goes up and then they make a connection in midair and then they tumble to the ground and then complete the act at rest on the ground. Uh, so because of that, it takes a, a certain volume of space for them to fly around because that's how they initiate copulation. So uh, what we're trying to do is make that volume smaller so they don't need to fly around as much. Maybe they can find each other at rest on the ground and mate. And so that can take what normally would take a very large volume of space, make it smaller, you can get higher production out of a smaller uh, unit of, of, uh, of volume and um, square footage uh, on the ground. Uh, and then also we're trying to make the food waste recycling process also uh, in a smaller volume of space. So you saw the shelves and the trays that we had. We're trying to stack our, our uh, recycling production. They can only go about 10 centimeters deep because they need oxygen. That's part of the reason why they get twitchy when there's too much oil because they can't breathe, they need oxygen. So they can only exist in these very shallow layers. Uh, so that's why we need to take what, you know, is probably a huge volume of food waste and split it up, put it into those shallow trays and stack it vertically, much like the vertical vegetable farms that we're doing. Uh, so those are the big constraints and the big challenges for using it in Singapore. Land is expensive. 
everywhere else around the world, they're doing this in rural areas using agricultural waste. Uh, they can use open air, uh, which is great for ventilation. This actually addresses one of the other questions that was back there. It is smelly. It does not smell like a garbage dump. It's not, um, it's not like a landfill. It's not rotting food, but they are actively digesting it. So there is a distinctive, I would say, uh, like a uh, sweet smell or a grainy smell. Um, weirdly, when I first started, uh, the leftover frass, the fertilizer, to me actually smelled like um, breakfast cereal. Bizarre. Um, but it has a distinctive smell. Uh, and if they are given too much food, more than they can handle in a given, say, few hours, then it does smell a little bit. It smells a little sour. They will uh, eat quite a lot in a short amount of time. The way we try to manage it is we give them only as much as they can eat within about 24 hours. So during that first 24 hours, the, the food itself might you know, have its own smell. You walk into a restaurant, you're gonna smell food. Uh, and basically we collect fresh food that day and feed them that very same day. So the food that we bring in is still warm from being uh, in the serving tins. So it's not rotting, it's fresh food, but it smells like, you know, you add an entire food court of food in one pile, it's not gonna smell great. Individually, it smells all right, but um, mm -hmm. that's just the nature of it. And what so- What if they hmm? yep. run out of the food that you fed, fed them in the 24 hours, would they start eating each other? Uh, no, they start actually re-going through. So the first time they go through a, 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 a unit of food, it's not going to be very well digested. It's well enough, but they will start to consume it again. And they'll draw out as much of the nutrients as they can get. Um, well. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah, that's why everywhere else does it in rural areas. You can get natural airflow. In Singapore, we really don't have that luxury. So... We're talking small spaces, indoors usually. So this takes really expensive and sophisticated air handling and air cleaning uh, equipment. So those are really the big challenges in Singapore. And to address another question that I saw earlier, um, uh, oh gosh, oh, uh, how, do I, how do we see this as being economically viable in Singapore? Um, as a standalone enterprise, I am skeptical. Uh, uh, Prof. Carrasco, which was one of the one of the PIs on this project, he did some economic modeling and showed that if the whole country could get on board and we could recycle a good portion of our food waste, it could very well be an economically viable, standalone, profitable uh, industry. But that depends on the economy of scale. Uh, if you do this in smaller scales, decentralized, and it's a standalone operation, your margins are gonna be very thin. Um, and so you may not be able to, you know, give your staff a paycheck after you pay the bills. So where I see it as being the best benefit is as a side project of an existing uh, company, kind of like what in, uh, Insecta and Citizen Farm do. So if I'm a chicken farm, for example, I've got a lot of chicken manure and other sort of waste, feed it to the black soldier fly, and then I can get some, you know, money on the side. Maybe I'm selling those larvae for fish food. Um, and if I'm a fish farmer, I would feed that fish waste probably to my black soldier fly and sell it to the chicken farmers. There's still some research to be done to show that you can do chicken manure, do black soldier fly, and then back to chickens. Biologically, it makes sense and it should be fine because mm -hmm. it's going through the gut of an entirely different organism. Um, but there are still concerns about, you know, animals 
feeding on their own kind ish. Um, so uh, as, as a side project, or uh, an augmentation of an existing business. If I'm a restaurant or uh, MBS uh, would be a great place. They have literally tens of tons, not during the circuit breaker, of course, but mm. they have tens of tons of food waste every single day. They have banquets all the time. Uh, and sadly, all that food is wasted. So um, if, you know, if I'm a if I'm a F and B owner that has a sizable business that's generating that amount of waste, I think this as a side business, it's it's just value added uh, because you're taking what is a waste and you're generating some sort of profit from it. And let's see if right. I can find other questions or if you all have. I think, the, I think, the, I think there were a few questions um, yeah. about uh, black soldier flies for human consumption. And I think, I think it was Gretel, she's like, will they taste different if they eat different kinds of food? Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. So that was, I think that was the only one that I managed to actually respond to in the thread, but oh, okay. for everyone else, um, this, uh, when it comes to taste for humans, I would assume that that would be the case. But mm -hmm. one of the things that we wanna look at is well, we know that the fat to protein ratio does vary based on the food that you give them. Their development varies based on the food that you give them. Uh, we've observed ourselves that you feed all plant waste. They develop very slowly. They don't get very big. Okay. You give them all protein waste. They develop really fast, get really big, but they produce a lot of ammonia. And it's really difficult to manage the, the smell. And it's not safe for people to be working around all that ammonia gas indoors. Okay. So they are omnivores. Um, you know, as, as, as we have evolved to be omnivores, um, they do quite well on a balanced diet. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that we hope to look at in the future is if you can uh, fine tune your inputs, mm -hmm. what kind of quality can you get at the end? And this is something that she alluded to, which was, or, or someone else alluded to that, uh, which is um, if I am trying to produce a certain type of protein feed for livestock, for a given livestock species, what sort of, uh, what sort of waste do I need to give them to be optimal for that species? And then also we have the frass, the, um, the fertilizer. Uh, it's not, it's, a lot of people call it compost, but it's not technically compost either. That's a whole other thing. Um, but it can be then composted. But uh, based on what you put in, you will get out a different quality of that fertilizer and you can do different things with it. Uh, either okay. higher nitrogen, lower nitrogen, higher carbon content. And this, uh, this is very important thing when it comes to first recycling the waste that we have and knowing how to best recycle it. And then knowing what we need to do with the end product. So if we're looking at growing vegetables uh, versus end parks using it for trees or, or woody species, you'd be looking at a different quality of frass that you want at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, another thing is that we've also been talking about is um, we have the anaerobic digesters, which are recycling a lot of organic waste. And those are great for things that are low value waste, like human waste uh, and other things like that, that we would consider as low quality and could not necessarily contribute to livestock feed. Whereas when we feed them food waste and even the food production waste like Insecta is doing, uh, all of those inputs that the black soldier fly are feeding on have already been cleared for human consumption before the black soldier fly are eating them. And so it's very logical to then state or claim or, or prove or show that the black soldier fly themselves are absolutely safe to feed to livestock that humans will eat or even humans themselves. We know that other places around the world um, 
are, whoops, I'm losing my battery. Uh, but uh, other places around the world are using them for human food. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't. It, there's just some regulatory hurdles that we need to get over and societal ick factor uh, <laughs> hurdles that we need to go over. Um, so I'm going to go grab my charging cable and I can be right back if uh, just take about 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, go show. All right. If someone else has more questions. Yeah, I think we'll get to Gwyneth's and Ivan's questions in that since yeah. that both of you are right here right now. Yeah, we can do, do those two questions before we call it a session. Yeah, I think I think I think uh, native animals is a good one for quiz. We can try that potentially. <laughs> or native species. Native species, yes, species. Okay, I'm back. Okay, maybe we could just do uh, Gwyneth's and Ivan's questions since that they're both they're both right here right now, patiently waiting. So Gwyneth's questions uh, question is that what are the pros and cons of using the black soldier flies versus red worms? And if there are other problems uh, other than space constraints when using the black soldier flies? So red worms uh, are very popular for composting um, our food waste as they should be. They're very efficient at it, but black soldier fly do the job much faster. That's one thing. Uh, another thing is I don't think people are using red worms for edible protein, uh, whereas we use that for black soldier fly. Um, and I am not sure of the provenance of the red worms. Are they native to Southeast Asia? I'm not sure. But I know black soldier fly are. They're considered pantropical. There's genetic evidence to suggest that they were once uh, originally native to the New World tropics, but long before humans came around, they were pantropical. So we consider them as a native species. Whereas the red worms, uh, I could be wrong again, but I don't believe that they are native. So that is one concern. We wouldn't want um, these things getting out. And to address what Nalini briefly talked about earlier. Um, yeah, it, when they do emerge, it is a cloud of, of, of flies. We keep them in cages, but let's say we had a national industry in black soldier fly uh, waste recycling, and there was some sort of breach. Well, it might be scary, but um, it's, uh, it's a situation where they really are not interested in coming near us. They don't transmit any diseases. They don't bite, they don't sting, they don't feed as adults. They don't transmit disease. I, maybe I already said that. <laughs> but um, uh, so it's, those are one of the things that we look at when it comes to either or. The red worms are great for some situations and in fact, they could be used in tandem. You can have black soldier fly recycling and then take that leftover, the frass, and feed it to red worms and they can break it down into what we would uh, recognize as soil thereabouts. Because when it first comes out of the black soldier fly, it's essentially a manure, like any other livestock manure. And it's not immediately usable as a fertilizer for plants. Um, that nitrogen that's in it that plants desperately need is still bound up in the microbes that are actively trying to break it down. So it needs a secondary composting uh, process to be acted upon. So um, yeah, uh, that's one thing that we also talk about is you could take your black soldier fly frass, you can compost it yourself to make it usable as a compost or then feed it to red worms if you have that situation available to you. Um, it's, it just comes down to preference. Red worms are much lower input and um, much easier to manage by yourself. That's, that's another great benefit of them. Um, but yeah, that's about it with that. Cool. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, last question. From Ivan. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we'll take this one last one. 
Uh, Ivan asks, could this selection for black soldier flies that can mate in smaller spaces be effectively uh, a form of domestication? Yep, that's exactly what it would be. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do is domesticate them more or less. Uh, and in fact, mating in smaller spaces, we can look at silkworm. Uh, the ancestral species obviously would fly uh, to its mate, um, but we've, over the course of thousands of years, we've domesticated them. They no longer need flight at all. And in fact, we facilitate all of their reproduction uh, either by machine or by hand. So we're, like Nalini said, we're really at the beginning stages of this with black soldier fly. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we have found in our research, in our brief research, that not just us, but others have realized that genomically, if I can get a little more technical with all these things, they are somewhat resistant to domestication. Uh, they have a very stable genome in that if you, uh, if they are inbred quite a lot. In other species, you inbreed them, um, then you start to, you can really start to bring out some of those traits very quickly. These are very resistant to what we call inbreeding depression or, or to this, to um, evolution, really. They're very stable. Um, it's, this is just my, thought or my opinion on it, but their entire life cycle is, is very ephemeral as adults, is very uh, short-lived, and it's a very transient uh, sort of existence. They come out, they only have about five days, really, to find a mate, lay eggs on a suitable food source, and then they die. Um, a, to look at the silk moth, they can feed as adults. They can hang out, they can, they can go here, there, wherever. Black soldier fly and their food source, black soldier flies, might be a rotting animal that just died and it's gotta get to that carcass <laughs> or what have you before it's eaten up by another organism, anything else. So they have to get there and if I'm the only one if I'm a female black soldier fly and I'm the only one there, I have to be able to ensure that my progeny are going to then have their own progeny. So they have some resistance to the problems that arise in inbreeding. Uh, so what is to their evolutionary advantage being that I may only find a sibling or a cousin out there because of what our food sources are, I've got to be able to handle that genetic pressure. Uh, but that, being resistant to that genetic pressure, actually hinders domestication. It means that we have to work a little bit harder to tease out those traits that we're looking for. I hope I made sense in all that and I wasn't flying over everyone's heads. Well, that's cool. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. Sure. Welcome. Yeah, we'll yeah. put um, the video on YouTube so anyone who's interested can, can watch this. And yeah, if I, if I said anything wrong there, someone pre please comment and correct me. <laughs> I'm and, pretty uh, sure I didn't, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Eric, thanks for staying behind even after the session has ended and uh, still um, taking questions and stuff. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Um, thanks for thanks for allowing us to stay after like this. Oh, glad, uh, glad it's useful. Sure. Yeah, of course. I felt like a few people want to stay on and just let some you know burning questions they had to ask. So yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks for the for the people who stayed behind for this little post session. Uh, so as usual, you guys know we are here every Friday, and we got the link for next week's event up as well by uh, Sean. So yeah, we'll see you next week. And uh, good luck in the coming week, guys. Bye-bye.